So back during spring break, I decided I wanted to solve the basal problem. A problem seeking to find a closed form for the sum of square reciprocals of all natural numbers. But I already knew the answer to that question, pi squared over 6. It was getting there that was the challenge. Luckily for me, I have a book that essentially serves as a roadmap for solving this exact problem. It doesn't exactly hold your hand and lead the way, but it does provide a trail for you to follow. Before we get started on the proof, I just wanted to highlight that while researching this, I discovered that Cauchy was actually the first to prove it using this method. And What's interesting about this proof is that you don't really need any calculus, except at the very end, to formalize the result. Now without further ado, we're going to start off with demonstrating de Moivre's formula. I think it's clear that we can replace all the x terms with nx terms without any issue in Euler's formula. And using exponent rules, we can show that cos x plus i sin x raised to the nth power is equivalent to all the previous expressions. Now typically, the statement is formulated like this, but for our purposes, we're going to focus more on the sine term. In Euler's formula, the cosine term is the real part, and the sine term is the imaginary part. What this means for us is that i sine of nx is the same thing as the imaginary part of the binomial expansion of cos x plus i sine x raised to the n power. A bit more concretely, sine of nx is the same thing as the terms of the expansion where sine has an odd power. Notice the alternating signs caused by the unshown powers of i involved. Just a bit more interesting history that I found while researching this, that sine result I showed you was actually discovered by Francois Viette in the 16th century, before de Moivre was even born. In fact, de Moivre was born 64 years after Viet died. I'm not sure why, but the fact that they never met makes me feel a bit melancholy. Anyway, something interesting about Viet's result is the extra term at the end of each of his statements. Functionally, what they do is make every other term zero and determine the sign of the non-zero terms. With that, we've reached the first landmark on our route and we're going right into the next one. Our next goal is to find a polynomial with roots cotangent squared of pi over 2m plus 1 through cotangent squared of m pi over 2m plus 1. Now, at this point, you may be asking, what? Why is that even remotely relevant? And if that is you, I can't fault you for that. Throughout proving this, and even more so throughout the process of editing this video, I found myself drawn towards an analogy. This proof is like following a trail of breadcrumbs into the unknown. As you probably realized, there's a reason that we derived de Moivre's formula before going into this part. If we factor out a sine to the n term, then we're able to rewrite this formula mostly in terms of cotangent. That's because definitionally, cotangent is cosine over sine, and by factoring out a sine to the nx, the power of the sine term became the negative of the power of the cosine term. Now we're going to let n equal 2m plus 1. The motivation for this decision comes from the fact that substituting that value for n causes the expression to be equal to 0 for x inputs in the form of some natural number times pi over 2m plus 1. After substituting 2m plus 1 for n, this is what the expression looks like. And since it's equivalent to sine of nx, it's still equal to 0 for the x values that we discussed. Now we can make another substitution. By introducing a new variable t, and replacing every cotangent squared term with it, we get a polynomial in t with the roots that we need. Now, we were able to ignore this sine term out front, because in effect, it's just a constant. Over the interval that we're interested in, it's never zero, and as a result, we're able to just leave it off the end polynomial. We're further along the path, but we've still got a ways to go if we want to solve the basal problem. Luckily, this video is sponsored by me, and I'm going to keep teaching you until we're done with this proof. Please subscribe if you want to support my channel. This next section marks a true milestone in this proof. The sum formulae we're about to derive are one of the two keys that we need to actually complete this proof. 
Our new goal is to find some formula for cotangent squared of pi over 2m plus 1 through cotangent squared of m pi over 2m plus 1. Due to the factor theorem, we're able to rewrite our polynomial p of x in this form. When you multiply a series of linear terms like this, multiplication can kind of be seen as a series of threads moving through each linear term. And when you add all the threads together, you get the fully expanded product. And the coefficient of the second highest order term works out to be minus the sum of all the constants. Remember though, we have this extra a term to contend with. Every term in the expanded polynomial has it as a factor. Since we know the full form of the polynomial though, we know exactly what a is. 2m plus 1, choose 1. We also know that the coefficient of the x to the m minus 1 term is 2m plus 1, choose 3. And as we know from the expansion, that just so happens to be equal to a times the sum that we're looking for. Using a bit of algebra, we can rewrite our cotangent sum as 2m plus 1 choose 3 over 2m plus 1 choose 1. This is the formula for n choose k, and it's what we're going to use to simplify the result. Now with a bit of fraction division, cancellation, and factoring, we can ultimately write the sum as 2m squared minus m over 3. You may have noticed though when I introduced this section that I used the plural formulae. There's a whole nother sum formula that we need. But don't fret, it's just the cosecant version of the cotangent sum we already found. And luckily, there's a handy little trig identity that will make this very easy. Every cosecant term in this new sum corresponds to a cotangent term in the old sum with an additional plus one. That means that the cosecant sum formula is the cotangent sum formula plus m. So in the end, we're able to write it as 2m squared plus 2m over 3. We're finally nearing the end of our path. We have one of the two keys that we need, and this next section will allow us to actually apply the sum formula we just derived towards solving the basal problem. If you start with a circle and draw these points on and about it, such that q is the center, r and s lay on the circumference, and t is the point collinear with q and s, with the additional property that the line segment RT is tangent to the circle at point R, then the following inequalities hold. The area of triangle QRS is less than the area of sector QRS is less than the area of triangle QRT, at least for some angle alpha between 0 and pi over 2. Triangle QRS has a base of 1 and a height of sine alpha, therefore its area is 1 half times sine alpha. The area of a circular sector is the angle over 2 times the radius squared, and in the case of sector QRS, the radius is just 1, so its area is simply alpha over 2. The tangent of angle alpha is TR, the opposite, over QR, the adjacent. And since QR is just the radius, tangent alpha is TR. This means that the area of triangle QRT is 1 half times tangent alpha. This means that our initial inequality is equivalent to saying that 1 half sine alpha is less than 1 half alpha is less than 1 half tangent alpha, over the interval mentioned previously. We can also just cancel out the 1 half terms and say that sine alpha is less than alpha is less than tangent alpha. This inequality is exactly what we need. We can modify it in the following ways to say that cosecant alpha is greater than 1 over alpha is greater than cotangent alpha, and squaring each of those terms does not change the orientation of the inequality. Perhaps you can already see how we're going to use this result in conjunction with our sum formulae to actually solve the Basel problem. One additional property that we have to establish is that adding like and associated terms in their respective parts of the inequality preserves the inequality. It's thanks to this property that the inequality can be rewritten to accommodate our sum formula. If we take our new inequality and multiply every term by pi squared over 2m plus 1 squared, the middle part of the inequality becomes the Basel problem. This is where the pi squared term that's in the solution actually comes into play. It might seem counterintuitive to do so, 
but we're going to rewrite our sum formulae in a less simplified form. This allows us to split the expressions into three fractions and shuffle the numerators and denominators as we wish. And now our pi squared terms have taken the more familiar form of pi squared over 6. Now, by strategically adding some zeros, we can pretty easily make these terms much more convenient. Our goal is to create a 2m plus 1 term in the numerator of each fraction. So for 2m, we can add and subtract 1. For 2m minus 1, we can add and subtract 2. And for 2m plus 2, we can subtract and add 1. You might be wondering why we went through all that trouble. Well, when I said it's more convenient in this form, I actually meant it's more convenient for taking a limit. See, to actually formalize this as an infinite sum, we have to take a limit as m tends towards infinity. And those fractional parts, with constants in the numerator and 2m plus 1 in the denominator, tend towards 0 as m approaches infinity. Thus, the limit of the infinite sum of 1 over the square numbers goes to pi squared over 6. And out of all things, it ended up being the squeeze theorem that got us there in the end. Honestly, I find it kind of funny, because the squeeze theorem is just one of those things you learn in Calc 1, and then you don't really use at all until, you know, something like this where you find yourself needing it. And with that, we've reached the end of the line. The Basel problem is solved. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments. I'll answer any that I can, and if I get enough, I'll probably make a follow-up video answering all of them. This video is not clickbait. This is the cat that's in the thumbnail. Goodbye.